Well, good morning, Grace family. So good to see you. Uh, man, it's been an incredible couple of weeks. Uh, we may not realize it because we come to our services and enjoy the experience, but this is made possible by uh, great musicians, singers, choir, technicians. Can you guys thank them for their service here at Grace? Thank you so much. Like between last week and moving into this week, I mean, that's a total of like six different environments, and I'm so blessed that we can just come and just to enjoy and to be and to celebrate what God is doing. Uh, I pray that your heart is getting prepared to celebrate Christmas. I know ours is as well. Uh, as I think about this celebration of Christmas, I'm struck by these words that I read this last week. The King of Heaven exchanged his throne for a cradle. The Almighty swaddled himself in humanity. The creator entered his own creation. The author put himself on the page. The infinite became an infant. The giver became the gift. On behalf of the elders and the staff, we really want to wish you a very Merry Christmas. Uh, we're so excited about the celebrations we're going to have this Friday. We encourage you not only to come out, but not just invite your friends, to bring your friends with you to come to a service on Friday, 1 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock, all three identical services. All of them have do-it-yourself pyrotechnics at the very end. A <laughs> lot of fun, you know. Nothing screams Merry Christmas like fire. Uh, I want to encourage you guys, be sure you register. And the reason, we're not trying to track you all, because I know sometimes we get nervous about registrations and all that. The main deal is this. We want people to have a seat. We want to know how to anticipate and to be just good hosts and to welcome people this Christmas. We don't want there to be like no room at the inn here uh, at Grace. If it is, we've got a space in the Student Center for Overflow that's like a manger, okay? Uh, we do have wild animals there during the week. They're called middle school students. <laughs> I've got one of them. <laughs> Uh, we're continuing this week as we uh, talk about the perfect gift. Uh, last week, Dave uh, looked at the life of Mary and the promise given to her by the Holy Spirit. Uh, today, we're going to take a look at Joseph and God's gift of provision, that God meets us in our hopelessness, that God meets us in our fear and our anxieties, and he gives us what we need to endure. And during a time of total desperation in Joseph's life, when it seemed like all hope was lost, all of his expectations of, of what it would look like to have that perfect life was dashed. God met him in a dream. He gave him a promise. And then he experienced God through a journey to Bethlehem. Let's pray. Father God, I do thank you for this time together that we get to gather as your people. Lord, we are only here because of the work of Jesus Christ. We thank you that Jesus came into this world, took on flesh, dwelt among us, humbling himself to be a babe, and Lord, in that, Lord, you gave your son for one purpose, to give him as a ransom for humanity, Lord. And so thank you, Lord, for the work of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your love as a good father who communicated how much you love us and what you gave in your son. Today, Lord, I need you. God, speak through me. I pray that my words would not be mine, but yours. Anything, Lord, that's of me, God, may I be silent. And today, Lord, I pray that you were mightily in the hearts of those here. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so I love Christmas time, not just the decorations and all that, but the story. And I think the story oftentimes is changed and twisted and tweaked based upon the little nativity scenes that we have set up around our house, sometimes the stories we see on TV. But what we're going to look is we're going to look at the text itself to see what it has to say about Christmas. Today we'll be in Matthew 1, uh, in the second half of that chapter, also the first part of Luke 2. And if you want to just look at the book of Matthew, if the if you like open it up there to Matthew 1, verses 1 through 17, verse 1, right away, that Matthew is letting us know about the genealogy of Jesus, basically letting us know the, the pedigree. Where does Jesus come from? And so if you actually look through that long list of names, what you will find out is Jesus comes from a pretty dysfunctional family. That, 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 that perfect Jesus comes from an imperfect bloodline. And that, in fact, I think if you looked at the family tree of Jesus, it would reflect something more like on Jerry Springer than the Disney Channel. That's just the reality of it. Many think that Matthew himself uh, was a, uh, a, a recorder, someone who took careful account. Uh, he was a tax collector, so he paid attention to details. Uh, if you look at, at the Gospel of Matthew, it covers robustly the stories and the teachings of Jesus uh, the two writers that got their uh, books out first were believed to be Matthew and Mark, and that was circulated. Uh, their writings were really robust to give us a picture and an understanding of the life and the teachings of Jesus. And don't forget, Jesus affirmed them and said, you know what? 
don't worry. You're going to remember everything that I've taught you, everything I've commanded. I'm going to give you a spirit that will help you, and it's God's spirit that allows us to have God's word. And that same spirit, as we share the word today, allows you to even understand it and to transform your life so that way you're different because of what Jesus has done. If we look at Matthew, he provided some really comprehensive accounts. There's things in Matthew that are nowhere else in any other gospels. And then there's times where you've got accounts in the other gospels, especially the synoptic gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke. In that, you look at Matthew, he provides an even broader description of what happened. In fact, because he was a tax collector, you'd think he, he was readying himself for an audit of his record. He was getting ready to share with the world the work of what Christ has done. Of all the disciples, uh, Matthew really wanted to focus in on Jesus' royal lineage, lineage that could be traced all the way back to King David and to Father Abraham. In total, there were a total of, of 28 generations uh, from Jesus to David. In total, about 1,000 years separated King Jesus and King David, and both of them were born in the town of Bethlehem. Matthew paid careful attention to connect the dots for a Jewish audience. They really wanted to know, is Jesus really the promised Messiah? Which is why in Matthew it starts by saying this, this is the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. The second part of chapter 1 and verses 18 through 25, that's where we're going to be focusing today, is known as the origin of Jesus. While Luke tells us that the Christmas story through the eyes of Mary Matthew actually shares through the eyes of Joseph and his experience. So read with me in Matthew 1, 18 through 19. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a, just a man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. As we begin this text here, we see that Joseph and Mary are betrothed in marriage. In a Hebrew marriage, there's three stages to a marriage before it's finalized. You see, when Joseph and Mary were young, their, their parents committed their kids to each other. This is an engagement. No ring was involved at this point. During their engagement, they, they grew up knowing that, that that would be my wife and, and that he would be my husband. This is kind of an arrangement between two families. And, and there, was, there was commitment to each other and there was love. The next phase of the relationship is called betrothal. This was a legal contract that was ratified between one family and another. Usually it was, it was the, the father of the groom providing a dowry or a gift to the father and to the family of the bride. And there it was ratified and now they were in the covenant of marriage that would then one day be finalized at the marriage. This period lasted for about a year. It was like a year-long engagement as they prepared themselves for the marriage. So in this story of Joseph and Mary, we find this event that happens in that year of betrothal. For Joseph, in the information that he got to find out that Mary is with child, this was probably the most humiliating news that he could imagine, that his wife was pregnant. You know, the reality is it says here that, that, that she was found with child. She was found pregnant. No one gets found pregnant. You get pregnant. Something happens that leads up to that. There's events that happen. And so Joseph, no doubt, is just sick over this, wondering what in the world is happening. I was committed to her, but is she committed to me? Because the text says that, that Joseph was faithful. While Mary's uh, pregnancy was known to Joseph, it was most likely not known to the community. It was something that was just between them at that point. In verse 19, we see that Joseph is legally bound to Mary as her husband. For most readers, this confuses us because we're like, wait, I thought they're just betrothed. It's not like in our culture. We don't have a legal obligation when we're engaged. Like you usually find out you're not engaged when a ring comes in the mail. And there's nothing beyond that. But here, it's, it's, it's this contract. It's legal. It's spiritual. And so in that, they were committed to marriage and he was committed to her even when it seems like she was not to him. In this account, we see the love of Joseph, that he cares for her. And rather than making a spectacle of Mary, and he could totally out her and shame her in the community and feel vindicated and validated. No, he does the honorable thing. He decides that he's gonna keep it on the down low. 
He's not going to make it a public thing because he loves Mary and he wants a future for her. And so he will swallow his pride and he will show grace. It says here that it would be a quiet divorce. Well, how do you do a quiet divorce when it's a public record? That's just the reality of it. Even in Hebrew culture, it was a public record. While the divorce would require witnesses to certify, Joseph would most likely only disclose to the essential number of people required to convey the divorce. He wanted to show Mary love. He wanted to be faithful to her no matter where she was with him. So in this moment, we see Joseph's character. He's a man who loves God because he's loved by God. The love and the security he finds in his relationship with God is able to show him grace in a season that is very challenging. As far as the story of Christmas, I think Joseph oftentimes is not even really a part of the story. He's kind of like that side story. He's just a guy along for the ride. I think sometimes as men, we feel like that. We feel like we're not a central part of, of the story. Sometimes as men, we feel like, man, no, they're leading spiritually, but I'm just on the side here. No, men, I'm just speaking to you now. God has called us to be a part of the story. You see, I think we look at the story in the Gospels, and we see that God chose Mary for Jesus, but men, I want you to know that God also chose Joseph. He's a man who was faithful to the Lord because he knew God's faithfulness to him. And so Joseph realized that he is being written into the story. As a man, I cannot begin to imagine the pain that Joseph was experiencing and going through. I'm sure Mary was telling him that, that there was nothing that happened, that she really was with child. And he's wrestling with his own insecurities, and he knows this is, with each passing month, going to become more and more public. Mary probably insisted her fidelity to him, but as a Hebrew man, Joseph knows the science. Mary was with child, and it's not his kid. What were Joseph's nights like? You know when the sun sets? That's usually when the depression sets in. That's when the sadness sets in. Like as the sun is going down on the horizon, Joseph feels like the sun is going down on his future. He feels like, man, that, that perfect marriage, that perfect life that I thought would be is now not. Now what? I'm trying to do my best to make it right for Mary, but Lord, what about me? He probably has trouble going to sleep. And then when he tries to gain sleep in his dreams, you think he could escape, but no, it only amplifies even more. And so then he wakes up to his anxiety. So I imagine his nights were hard. I imagine his dreams were not peaceful. So in his moment of desperation, he's pleading out to God, God, help me. What does God do? God meets him in a dream. Meets him in a dream. You see here in this text, God provides us comfort in our confusion. When you're confused, when you don't know what the future holds, where you have anxiety and literally led into panic attacks, God can meet you in your anxiety and he can give you comfort in your confusion. You see, Joseph's name in Hebrew means God will add his name is one of favor. What seems like an event that will rob Joseph of his future, God will actually bring blessing. You see, God will add one to their family who will not only change Joseph's life, Jesus will change Joseph's eternity. And so we have this scripture here in verse 20. But as he considered these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. As God addresses Joseph in a dream through an angel, it remind, he reminds Joseph of his identity. He reminds Joseph that you are son of David. Remember who you come from. Remember to whom you belong. You are a son of royalty. Lift your head up. Family, you need to know who you are. If you're in Jesus, you are a child of God. You're a child of the King. Lift your head up. You are royalty. He's got plans for you, church. You see, as he conveys this, God is reminding him that just as God would use King David, God is going to use Joseph in his epic story as a humble man of humble means, a carpenter, that he would be a father, a mentor to the Son of God. Talk about pressure. Wow. So who is this angel? Many think it's Gabriel, the same who visited Mary, but there's no mention of a name. 
In fact, this one's different in that Mary had an encounter while she was awake. Joseph had an encounter while he was asleep. So he has this dream, this vision, the, the, the angel speaking to him, confirming truth. But when Joseph woke up, he had to, in faith, to believe that God spoke to him. What faith? And how do we know he had faith? Well, we just look at his life. As far as the promise that was given about uh, Mary being uh, with, with child that was conceived of the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, people often ask, man, what is the nature of the conception of Jesus Christ? Because there's no scientific explanation. I, I think there's some people that are like, man, I would love to know what is the composition of Jesus' DNA. I'd like want to see that under a microscope. What we see in the creation account of Genesis is that God doesn't need anything from us to make something. That God can make matter from nothing. In, in, in Latin, that's ex nihilo. It's, it, it's from nothing. That God can speak something into existence because God is a creator. And so in that moment, God breathed and spoke life into Mary and she was with child. And so as we look at the conception of Jesus, it's not half Mary and half Holy Spirit. Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't need a 23 and me to figure out who he is. He knows who he is. He's from the Father. Family, he's not of this world. Amen. He was born of the Spirit. So that's why when you are born again in Jesus Christ, you are born again of the Spirit, just like Jesus. And when you're born in Jesus Christ, family, you are not of this world. Amen. Your citizenship is somewhere else, and you are just passing through town. As God comforts Joseph, the words of his great-grandfather, 28 times removed, probably was running through his mind in Psalm 119, 76. Let your steadfast love comfort me according to your promise to your servant. Family, we have to cling to promises. And the good news is the promises that God makes are constant and faithful. And I know as people, we break promises all the time, but God never breaks his promises with us. See, God promises to David and the nation of Israel that he would establish through his servant, Joseph. Joseph's grief is now turning to gratitude. Just as Joseph was faithful to God, God would be faithful to him. What seemed to be a sad circumstance is now an occasion for celebration. And so now we look at the text in verse 21. She will bear a son and you shall call him, his name, Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. In this passage, we see that God provides us peace in our purpose. That, man, when we got anxiety and fear, and we don't know how it's going to resolve, man, God meets us right there with his peace because he's working a purpose in our life. In verse 21, Joseph is given Jesus' name. His name is Jesus, which is Joshua in Greek. Jesus is Jesus, because people spoke Greek. So that's the language. In Hebrew, Jesus' name is Joshua or Yahshua, which is the conjunction of two words, of Yahweh and Shua, Yahshua, God saves. And so Jesus is the one who will be the savior to the world. And to us, you know, unless you're, you know, unless you're from a Latin country and you name your child Jesus, I don't know anyone who's naming their kids straight up, straight up Jesus. Because that's just going to give so much pressure for that kid. But no, Jesus back then was a very common name. But a very common name is by this name that no other name under heaven by which we are saved. That this very humble, this very ordinary man, this man named Jesus would be savior of the world. The angel of the Lord reminds Joseph that Jesus is the Messiah that the prophet spoke of. By now, 1,000 years has passed since the reign of David. They were all waiting for a king to come, which is why Jesus was not revered as a king. They were waiting for a ruler to come. For 28 long generations, they were feeling hopeless, occupied, defeated, and they were waiting for the fulfillment of Isaiah 7, 14. And here, as Joseph hears this from the angel, he's reminded that his betrothed, Mary, is this young woman or virgin that would give birth to the Messiah. How epic is that? Wow. While Joseph is responsible for naming Jesus, he's reminded that Jesus is Emmanuel, 
which means God with us. In this message from the angel, Joseph finds peace in his purpose. While it seemed like he was afflicted, the angel is affirming Joseph that it is well. And in this season, whatever you're going through, whatever hardship, whether it's financial, relational, physical, or even spiritual, whatever you're going through, God is wanting to meet you in this space and to remind you, not only am I for you, I am with you. And Jesus is this tangible reminder that God is the one who meets with us. We don't go and meet with him. That he dwells with us. And so in this moment, Joseph knows that he's gonna face tons of opposition. There's going to be people who are not gonna believe the story. There's going to be people as Mary becomes more and more evidently pregnant, it's going to be hard to explain to people what has happened. But here's the reality. He doesn't need their approval because he has the approval of the Lord alone. Amen. So where are you going? There may be people in your life where you're trying to get validation from them. You're holding out to hope, thinking that, man, if they will just give me that affirmation, if they will just, will just own up to it and say, I'm sorry, that I can finally be set free, family, we have to stop being hijacked by other people's spiritual maturity. You need to find your identity and who you are in Jesus Christ, and that will set you free. Lost my spot, but it's all good. I think in these times that, that, that Joseph had to turn to his grandfather's words of David in Psalm 57 and say, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, pleading, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by and they will pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills purpose for me. As we go through suffering, it's critical to remember there is purpose in our pain. For those who are not in Jesus Christ, I grieve. The pain they go through is wasted. But in Christ, there is purpose in your pain. It is for your good and his glory. It's an amazing thing. So in this, how do we know about Joseph's confidence in the Lord? Well, he does not question or doubt God when he wakes up. He simply obeys and does what the angel tells him to do. When it says in verse 25 that Joseph did not know her until she gave birth to a son, I'm going there. There are two implications here. The first is that nothing happened between them physically before Jesus' birth, even though he legally married her before the birth. That he didn't use his situation as an excuse to compromise or cut corners. Family, don't compromise. Next, the scripture implies that Joseph and Mary consummated their marriage after the birth of Jesus. For my Catholics are now freaking out in the crowd. There is no perpetual virginity in Mary. It's not true. It's unbiblical. There's a reason why the word is, the word until is there. Every word in scripture is intentionally placed there. The until means she, Mary, is a person just like you, that she's in marriage. She loves her husband and her husband loves her. Guess what? They have kids, other kids. Why? Jesus is called the firstborn. Why would he be called the firstborn if there was no one else born? So here in this story, we see that, that Jesus shares humanity. He shares relationship. Joseph and Mary, honestly, were ordinary people just like you who are used by God. We need, to stop, we need to stop placing people in the Bible on these pedestals. Family, in Christ Jesus, we are all saints. And the one who has total supremacy and authority and power, the one we pray to is Jesus. He is our mediator and no one else. And so Jesus, he had a brother. His brother was James, James the Just. He was credited as writing that book. Now Jesus is able to be that high priest who can identify with us and, and to meet us because he went through the same things as we did and yet was without sin. And Jesus himself, he had to endure a younger brother. Go figure. I was that younger brother. But in light of all of that, that God is faithful to his people. And if anyone is wrestling over the revelations that just happened in this service, there's counseling directly after. As we continue in the story leading to the birth of Jesus, we will move from Matthew to the Gospel of Luke. It is through Luke that we gain information about this journey into Bethlehem. While Matthew was written for Jews, uh, and it covered the story through Joseph's experience in the Christmas story, Luke is written from the perspective of Mary to a Gentile audience. Remember, Matthew's written to a, a Jewish audience. Luke is written to a Gentile audience. And if you look at the 
heritage or the lineage there, it actually goes all the way back to Adam. Why? Because the author wants the world to know that this Jesus is not just for the Jews, this Jesus is for everyone. That, that this, this first Adam who failed, that God sends his second Adam, Jesus Christ, and that Jesus Christ, that second Adam, is good news for the whole world. And so we find this in text in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all, uh, all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn." Cue all the Christmas stories that come to your mind right now in the text. What we see is that Jesus' birth began with, with this most remarkable event, and it happened during, a, uh, during one emperor's remarkable reign. It's this man named Octavian. He was actually an extended member of the family. He was adopted by Julius Caesar. And then when Julius Caesar was assassinated, remember a tu brute assassination, then Octavian, along with Mark Anthony and Lepidus, they became the three rulers of kind of a divided empire of Rome. The next 14 years was a bloody battle for control. So you had, you had uh, Octavian and Mark Anthony overcome Lepidus. Then it was Octavian and Mark Anthony. And Octavian was, he was a powerful general. Wise. He, he knew how to, how to command his troops. And so what happened is they actually defeated Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. And so that's that story of history. Again, I like history. That's kind of my thing. So then after that event, he became the sole Caesar, the Caesar Augustus. And he then, what did he do? He ordered a census because he wanted to see who he now reigns and rules over. Why? Because he wants to tax all of them. Because he wants to pay back and to make good on what he had done. Now this event is critical. Why? Because it lets us know the timing of Jesus' arrival. So when Joseph and Mary were rolling into Bethlehem, this was, was right around the time of what would be 6 to 4 B.C. This time was not December, family. It was probably late September. But we'll still celebrate on the 25th this year, Okay. But the, the whole premise of this reign of this Caesar Augustus is this ushered in the Pax Romana, that there was peace. There would no longer be fighting and bloodshed. Yes, he would reign with an iron fist with control, but he would build infrastructure and roads. The language, Koinonia Greek, was used everywhere. What a perfect opportunity for the gospel to go out. God is so divine in his timing Everything is intentional. Family, when there are godless kings and rulers and even godless presidents, I'm not saying this one, I'm just saying whatever ruler you want to talk about, it doesn't matter where they're at with Jesus, our God reigns. His timing is perfect. That Jesus came into this world when everyone thought that it was the worst time ever, God's like, no, this is the time. It's happening now. And so that's when Jesus came into the world as we read the account, we see that Joseph must leave his hometown of Nazareth and return to the city of, of King David's birth. Both of them were born in Bethlehem. This journey was like 80 miles, all right? It was not close. They couldn't really drive fast. They didn't have cars. This trip took four to seven days. Mary was like nine months pregnant, so she was like really pregnant. Wives, moms, I mean, are you ready for that baby to be born in that last month? Yes. Yeah. Like, like, you're like, man, you can say you know, the whole pregnancy, man, I love pregnancy, but that ninth month, you're, you're like done, and you're like, I want this baby out. I don't even want to go on a trip to the store, let alone 80 miles to Bethlehem. So here, they're going out. And then they're going there to Bethlehem, where all the extended family is coming, because again, that's the family place of heritage. All the family... The people that you have not met in many years are coming together for a census, and here you come into Bethlehem 
really pregnant, and then you got to tell them the story of what this angel told you. Yeah, right. How awkward can it get? But here they were, were confident in what God was doing. And then we know the story. They, they were trying to find some place to stay, but it's trying to like, find a hotel room like graduation week here at Chico with Chico State. Like you can't even find a hotel room anywhere. They were booked up for months over the census. Everyone knew it was coming. They had, they had no place to stay. There was no room at the end. But a commentator from Barclays said this, and it just struck me. He says that there was no room in the end was symbolic of what was to happen to Jesus. The only place where there was room for him was on a cross. While we celebrate the life of Jesus, there is this sobering reality that Jesus came into this world for one purpose, to give his life as a ransom. That a baby was born so that he would die and raise again for you. Joseph and Mary would be forced to have their child in a manger. Justin Martyr in 150 AD, he said, yeah, the, the place of his birth was this cave in Bethlehem. There you have Church of the Nativity built on top of it, but really it's just a, a humble cave. It, it's, it's basically a rock face cut out where animals could find shelter from the rain. It's in this humble place that Mary would give birth to Jesus. And so as we look at the story, we see this. God provides us joy in our journey. God provides us joy in our journey. Later in Luke, in verse 219, it says that Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. As Mary and Joseph recounted where they had come from, their humble roots, the adversity, the challenges, when it seems like they were finally moving in the right direction, God interrupts their life. In the moment, it felt like it was the worst thing ever, but man, they were going to be the vehicle of the best news ever. And rather than grumbling, they were, they were grateful for what God was doing in and through their life. And so as they gaze on Jesus in a smelly manger in the city of David, they probably reflected upon the words of David in Psalm 16. You make known to me the path of my life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. As we close here today, I want to take some time to reflect. I know this year that we can sing all the Christmas songs we want and we can put up all the lights we want, but it may not change what's going on in here. I know that we are dealing with things that are messy. I know that we are fearful. I know we have anxiety. I know that we have things in life where we feel like we have no control. And you know what? You don't. And just embrace that our God is sovereign. He reigns. You see, our lives are filled with smelly, dirty stories. Our lives are full of mangers. As people, we have the tendency to focus more on the, the mess of the manger in our lives than we do on the king who was born in one. If you just look at the scene of Jesus' birth, it's, 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 it's a dirty place. It's messy. And if you think about a birth, it's definitely messy. Now, I, I, I will never forget when my first daughter, Amanda, our firstborn was born, Man, I, nothing could prepare me for that. I don't care how many like Lamaze classes you can take. Nothing can prepare you for that. And so, so you're there in that space and, you, and you're, you're like ready for this, but you're as ready as you can be. And then in that moment, like, man, I just, kudos to my wife. Like, <laughs> seriously, moms out there, you rock. Seriously, you just give up for the moms out there? Seriously, yeah. Now, when... When Missy was pregnant with Amanda, like Amanda's all moving inside and Missy would like grab my hand. She's like, feel this. And I like, put my hand over it. Don't worry, I'm not pregnant. Anyways, put the hand over there and I can feel the baby. And she's like, man, Brian, don't you wish you could be pregnant like this? <laughs> At that time, I just wasn't real wise. I just answered honestly, no, I, I don't. I'm so happy it's you. So happy it's you. She's like, why not? I'm like, I don't know. I got like visions of the movie Alien. You know, I, I just like, I just, you know. So I'm like, no, but I'm, I'm happy. And, and, then, and then, then Amanda comes. And man, what a long, it was like 23 hours. And then a lot of push in. Man, uh, this wasn't even the last service, but I'm just gonna throw this in. It's like a freebie. Director's cut. All right. So um, man, uh, they, they, they said, we're gonna have to pull out the, 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 the vacuum to, to help her come out. And I'm thinking like the vacuum is like some sophisticated tool or device because we're at a very sophisticated facility. But no, they come out with a suction cup. They literally just attach to the head. And I kid you, like, they're like, okay, this next push, we're going to pull. And they, they pull, they go, freak me out. 
The doctor looked at me. I thought her head came off. It didn't, just in case you were wondering. It didn't come off. But man, uh, when Amanda came out, you know, I look back, man, it was just like, you know, like the, the, the movies where the, the, the mom has the baby and they take the baby and they're, here's your baby. It's just like, just clean. <laughs> yeah, that's not true. No, no. I was like, wow, wow. Then the rush of emotions that, that go through you of joy and fear, elation, anxiety, all that all at once just goes through you. And I was in th that moment realizing for the very first time how much my mom loves me, her great love. And in this, as we look at Jesus born into a messy world, and for those of you that have the privilege to be parents, and I know there are those out there that would love to be, that man, God loves you more than you could ever love anyone. And we find it in the son who's born in this messy stable. And so as we look at Jesus, who is born into a broken and perfect world, comes into a smelly, messy circumstance, it is in that dirty manger, in that mess of a circumstance, that we have to look beyond the manger, and we have to look at the person, Jesus Christ. We have to realize that, that God has given us Jesus, that God gives us a new beginning, a, a beautiful, miraculous birth within the dirt. Family, what you're going through is exactly where Jesus was born. He changes our focus. He, he's calling us back to him because when we do this, when we seek Jesus, we, we put him first. We focus on the king, not on the manger. We focus on the glory. We, we don't focus on the dirt. We encounter something that is life-changing. We encounter a God who is already in the manger, ready to give birth to a new life family. He wants to do a new work in you. Maybe there are parts in your life right now that look like a smelly, dirty manger, and you're living it. This Christmas, remember that Jesus Christ was born in one, so when we encounter our own mangers, we can know that God has been there all along. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, <laughs> that your son was born into a broken and a messy world to do an amazing work. And so, Lord, I am grateful that your son, Jesus, comes into my life and those here into our broken, messy lives and is about doing an incredible work. May we be transformed by your provision this Christmas. Thank you for the provision of your son, Thank you for the provision of how you speak to us, God, through your word, through your spirit, and for some, even through dreams. But Lord, whatever the case, we thank you that you've revealed yourself through the work of Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, guys, you may have seen some of you on an email that went out to you. I really want you to reflect today. What gift have you been given because of Jesus this year? It's not about the gifts under your, pre under your tree. It's not about anything on your, on your wish list. There's something more profound, something more transcendent that has been given to you because of the work of Jesus. And what I want to encourage you to do is to decorate the tree that we have in the lobby. There's ornaments you'll see on a table. I would love for you to write down what Jesus has given you and let's celebrate that and put that on the tree so that way as people come to service this Friday, they will have this beautiful tree that declares the work of what God has done. I want to encourage you, please join us this Friday for one of those three services. If you do all three, we get you a punch card. No, we don't. <laughs> Just do one. <laughs> please come early. If, I mean, at least come on time, if not early. And please bring someone with you. This may be the year where someone's life is transformed by the gospel, but that will not happen unless you invite them to come. Guys, if you've got something you're going through, if you've got the mess of a manger going on in your life, we have some prayer warriors up here, my good friend Corey and over here, Tammy. They would love to pray for you. Would you do this? Be honest. There is no shame. Because of God's grace, we can be honest. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So come and share what you're going through. And catch this. If you're having like a great day, they want to hear about that too. So let's celebrate. Amen? Amen. All right, guys. We look forward to seeing you on Friday. Now that we've got as a church, go and be the church. See you on Christmas Eve. God bless.